Thank you very much. It's extremely, it's impossible to live up to such an encomium. And uh, I, I'm sorry if uh, what I say will ha have a very improvised uh, appearance uh, in comparison with, uh, with what the expectations that Ray has aroused. It is true that on the whole, I am on the right. Uh, uh, we've already seen what the left means because uh, it was perfectly displayed in front of us by in that excellent talk by Ian McGilchrist. And I, I, I think what I'm going to do is explain just what the right position is in response to it. Uh, and um, this will be a position which attempts to revitalize what I call humane understanding, that, that aspect of the human condition which was supposed to be taught in our universities under the broad heading of the humanities, uh, and which has found itself under attack both from within the humanities by something called theory, uh, a theory applied to, a subject about, to subjects about which there can be no theory, and from outside by neuroscience, which has, of course, uh, challenged us to redefine the territory. I want to start from the excellent example that, that Simon produced for us yesterday. Uh, Papetti's uh, Tentation de saint hilarion a uh, um, French 19th century uh, work. Uh, obviously, an uh, 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 important question about this painting is what is it saying? Is it, I mean, a very clear and uh, obvious uh, response is he saying, you know, that the fruit's gone off and the, uh, the background music is awful, can't we go somewhere else? <laughs> and, um, <coughs> uh, 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 but um, a, more, a more sophisticated observer would say, no, no, it's about temptation and resisting it. Um, but, um, you know, I, liked, I, I, I share the feelings of that character from Oscar Wilde who says, I can resist anything except temptation. Uh, and um, clearly, saint Hilario is not in that position. But uh, if you look at this painting and ask yourself, what does it mean? The first, the most important thought that will occur to you is that actually it means nothing. It's a fake. Uh, the emotions expressed are not given a real embodiment or a real, a ca a real countenance that could enable us to sympathize with them. Uh, the whole thing is kitsch. And that's a really interesting word, kitsch, which came into the language from Austrian German in the, uh, the turn of the end of the 19th century. And nobody really knows what it means. And, and I, I will come back to that because I think understanding the difference between art and kitsch is one of the things that the humanities ought to be teaching us. Um, I'm going to start from another painting, however, which is certainly not kitsch. So uh, Simone Martini's Annunciation which just uh, represents a scene that may or may not have occurred, but uh, represents it in an extremely beautiful way. This is in the Uffizi in Florence. Um, what, great question is, what do we see in this picture? Uh, we see an angel. We see the Virgin Mary. We see a scene from the Bible. But we see other things, too. We see a, a kind of idealization of the feminine, if you look at the Virgin's form, uh, a representation of of uh, feminine modesty and uh, retiring, uh, a, a retiring attitude, which is, uh, if you like, schematized, but given a, a poetic and, and reverberating form. If we see a way the world might be, uh, you know, in which uh, in innocent women uh, are visited from another sphere by, by beautiful beings. We see a, a narrative about the relation between God and man, and we also see a fiction, for many people this is a fiction at least, that has changed the appearance of reality. The, the concept of, uh, of the Annunciation is embedded in our culture and in uh, many, many of our ways of, of seeing the relation between, uh, not only between God and man, but, but also between uh, lovers and between people generally. So, how do you explain what you see? Uh, this um, picture that you see, that you saw, uh, was produced, of course, uh, by a camera photographing uh, a picture in the Uffizi, uh, and um, that was translated into a, a digital language, uh, into a digital, digital format, uh, and translated finally onto the screen it had to appear in the form of pixels of different colors, displaying before you the, uh, the image on the screen. So you, you have a, a digital image 
the algorithmic code which um, encapsulates it uh, and transfers it, and then finally its realization and the pixels on the screen. And many people would say that this is a, a paradigm case of uh, transformation, the transfer of information from one thing to another, uh, and it has something in common with uh, what we know about the visual cortex and how it works, uh, and it seems that, in fact, we have reverse engineered a little part of the visual process. That, you know, what goes on when light hits the retina uh, is um, then reorganized in, in digital form as it passes along the synapses of the uh, um, visual nerve and ends up in the visual center of the brain. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is, have, uh, can we really re reverse, the, uh, reverse engineer the whole process? The image on the retina passes to the visual center of the cortex, that is true, in something like the way the digital image passes to the screen. I think we can perhaps accept that. Um, you know, a lot of refinements have to be built in, but there isn't any mystery about how that occurs. But, of course, the computer doesn't see the thing that is d d displayed on the, the screen. We see it when we look at the computer. Uh, we see it because we interpret it, and we interpret it, as I said before, in many different ways. We interpret uh, the thing that we see on the screen uh, and things that we see in the thing that we see on the screen. We also, many of the things that we see when we look at the screen, uh, we don't believe to exist. Uh, we certainly don't believe that that woman and that angel exist in the place where we see them. And we may think that they never existed at all, but still we see them. So this interpretation requires a huge act of what you might call semantic descent, where you descend from the, the, uh, the, the pure representation on the screen to an interpretation of a world that is represented within that screen. Uh, and this is what happens also, of course, in the visual center. Uh, but um, we don't need any more reminding of the point that Peter Hacker has made so many times so, so well, that it's not the, that bit of the cortex that does the interpreting or does the seeing. It's we who do the seeing and the interpreting. No doubt there is a, a way of explaining this. We haven't got it yet. There is there's something going on. There's a physical process going on which will explain just how it is that I and you uh, come away from that uh, experience of the Simone Martini Annunciation with a sense of what it is about and what it says. Uh, but um, that's an explanation of how we obtain from this information about something. Information used in, com the concept of information used in uh, computer science uh, and related disciplines is not a, uh, a concept of information about it's, a, it's a, a completely different concept concerning uh, the uh, information, concerning the ways, the, the number of alternative ways that you can uh, move out of a, or down a particular digital pathway. And it doesn't need the concept of aboutness in order to be developed. Uh, and this is, as many of you know, has caused a great problem among those who think that nevertheless the mind must operate as a computer. That, um, that uh, pro the problem of intentionality. So <clears throat> I want to uh, uh, use this example to ask some questions about how we understand appearances. Uh, I, I think um, uh, Ray Tallis made it very clear in his, his talk that uh, much of the mystery of our condition resides in the fact that we, um, we understand the world through the way it appears and not necessarily through the way it is, but the way it appears is extremely rich for us. It, it has a content far beyond anything that can be revealed to an animal and something that we don't necessarily immediately understand. That we come to, un we come to find things in appearances which we don't find immediately on, uh, on first encountering them. So among the things that we understand in the Simone Martini is the non-existence of the woman that we see on the screen uh, the possible non-existence of the woman represented by that woman on the screen. That, namely, uh, uh, we understand that this is a, a representation of the Virgin Mary who may or may not have existed. Uh, I, and we also recognize, we understand this picture in most of us uh, in a way that is indifferent to the question whether she existed. 
This picture, uh, uh, let me go back to it. Um, you don't have to have the full uh, panoply of Christian belief to be moved by this picture, uh, uh, to respond to it with a complete, keeping an open mind as to whether this scene ever occurred, knowing nevertheless that it contains a deep truth about, uh, uh, first of all, about womanhood, and secondly, about the relation of humanity in general to the divine. And uh, that's something that you can, that's a thought that you can entertain without having any belief in the existence of any of the creatures there uh, re represented. So uh, uh, that's a, a well-known feature, of course, of, uh, of intentionality, that this indifference to existence. And uh, it uh, leads us to ask general questions about pictures and about the aboutness of pictures. You know, um, pictures are about things, but like many other uh, artifacts, uh, they can be about things that don't exist. They can about be about things without determining whether or not they exist. They can be about things and leaving it indeterminate what, those, uh, what many of those properties of those things are. In fact, that's a general feature of fictions, that they are indeterminate. Uh, you know, how many children had Lady Macbeth, etc.? Uh, what was Hamlet doing before the beginning of the play? Uh, you know, all, all the questions that have troubled you in your uh, um, half-waking moments. Uh, about fi fictions. There are infinitely many unanswerable questions about every fiction and about every picture. Uh, so there's a problem of intentionality. Many people think, and I think Ray Tallis uh, raised this possibility, that intentionality uh, poses something like an insuperable difficulty for the uh, attempt, at least by many kinds of reductionists and physicalists, to reduce the human mind to the physical processes in the brain. I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, um, I keep an uh, open mind about it. I know that uh, David Papineau, for instance, would say it isn't an insuperable difficulty. Um, uh, and, uh, even if it is not insuperable, however, it is something that we have to account for, and it is something which creates a completely different order of things uh, from the order that is uh, normally explored by empirical science. Even so, aboutness is not what it is about. It's not what the, the question of understanding appearances is really about. Because there are other um, institutions which create the same kind of problem uh, and uh, without being about anything. The obvious instance is music. Uh, I think we, tomorrow we're going to have a, a, a short concert at a certain stage, and after, which, after dinner I might venture some some, some specific thoughts about music, but here is just a, one or two thoughts to be going along with. Uh, well, when you hear music, when you hear a, a melody, uh, Ian has uh, indicated something to this effect already, uh, you don't hear sounds only. Uh, you hear something beginning in the first of those, when the first of those sounds is heard, and carrying on through the sounds to the, uh, to the end of the melody. Most of this process might be silence. If you remember the, the theme that Beethoven uses for the variations of the third symphony, the last one of the sym third symphony, it goes bom, 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 bom. Yeah. That's all silence except for a few little uh, pointillistic uh, interruptions. Uh, yet you know that something's going on all the way through it. Uh, it's, it begins at a certain point, it moves up under its own strength to another point, and then falls f uh, through a whole octave, uh, and so on. It continues, you, you know, the, 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 um, if the melody, that melody is not familiar to you, uh, there's something wrong with your education, obviously. Um, <coughs> and um, it's a very good illustration of the fact that musical movement is not simply a matter of sequences of sounds. It's something that begins and continues through silence with a, uh, an impetus of its own uh, and carries on to points of closure and so on. Uh, uh, so when we hear music, we're hearing something in sounds which is not itself a sound. Uh, it's, uh, the sounds are not about anything. 
We know that music, at least that kind of music, doesn't represent the world in any way. It is simply itself. Many people used to use the word absolute music to describe it, meaning that it doesn't uh, have any meaning other than it, uh, what is intrinsic to it. But nevertheless, it isn't simply reducible to the sounds in which we hear it. Uh, and many people at this point begin to talk uh, uh, either about emergence or about supervenience. There are lots of technical um, uh, terms that are introduced into philosophy to try and pin down the relationship that we have in mind when we uh, are referring to the things that we see in a picture or the things that we hear in a, a symphony and so on. Uh, that uh, the, the woman in the picture, we might say, uh, is nothing over and above the pixels in which we see her. Meaning by that, that if all those pixels are in place, then so is the woman. Nothing else has to be added. Um, and, um, and we've seen that. That's, that's, that's how the whole mechanism uh, of the computer generation of images works. You know that if you produce all the pixels in the right distribution, you've produced the image. You don't need to instruct the computer to go on having produced the pixels to, to add the image to it. You see the image in the, those pixels and there is nothing that has to be added uh, uh, to, uh, to in order to produce them, which is what, what makes the whole mechanism possible. Likewise, you might say the melody is nothing over and above the sequence of sounds in the same way. If you've produced well, those sounds at the right pitch in the right order, you've produced the melody. Um, uh, you know, and uh, one way of putting this is to say that uh, the, the, uh, the the image and the melody are supervenient on the physical processes in which you see or, or hear them. And, and many people want to say something similar about the human person. The person is nothing over and above the human being in which you encounter him or her. Um, that's to say, if all the material properties of the human body uh, uh, in its law-governed behavior are in place, then we will encounter the person who is embodied in that uh, human being. Uh, uh, there's nothing further needs to be add, uh, added. We don't have to add, for instance, a soul or something like that if we've got the body and its behavior according to its normal uh, organic laws. Uh, and, you know, that's, uh, that seems in many ways a, a perfectly plausible thing to say, and surely it's what neuroscience is trying to make us say. It's trying to make us say that, look, however, what, what, however Peter Hacker goes on about the myriological fallacy and, and the conceptual impossibility of describing the brain in this way, nevertheless, if the, those brain processes are there, then you damn well have got uh, the person and not just the, 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 the human body. And they, they are probably right. Um, and uh, David Papineau goes further. He says that, this is, uh, reflects a, a deep truth about the universe, that if the particles are all in place, the, the, the elementary particles that make up the universe, uh, and the laws of physics that hold, uh, hold, uh, hold true, then everything else follows. You know, that all the rest spills out of that. Uh, of course, uh, we, we have to have very special capacities into a, in which, with which to observe all the rest, uh, but, um, you know, it, it nevertheless uh, all... Uh, spills out according to the uh, inevitable laws uh, of motion of the universe as a whole. But of course, we don't. that doesn't help us to say just what is everything else uh, and whether the everything else is, is fully comprehensible by the scientific methods that we uh, employ in the empirical sciences. Also, you might raise another question which I won't raise in this talk, which is this. What exactly are those particles that are supposed to be all in place in order for everything to follow? Uh, if you dig down deep enough, as we know, those particles have a, an awful habit of uh, evaporating uh, under the human gaze, uh, becoming quantum fields about which nothing can be said except the prob probabilities of the distribution of energy at certain, uh, certain places over certain areas rather within them. Uh, and um, you know, so that, and then it becomes very unclear that what we've got down to is really independent of the thing that's digging down to find it. Yeah, um, uh, many people feel so 
um, queasy at this point that they decide that it was a mistake to begin the whole process of investigation in the first place. But I want to say, I want to go back here uh, to um, what it is that, that causes people to worry about the <coughs> thing I referred to earlier, the invasion of the humanities by the, the, the natural sciences. And I want to talk about um, a concept which is not a tremendously fashionable, the concept of Geist, um, spirit, as it's often translated, which was given a, a, um, a leading role in, in philosophy by Hegel, uh, and uh, which is, became, during the 19th century, uh, a, a topic of consideration by many philosophers in Germany who, who thought that, indeed, if there is a purpose for a university education apart from empirical science, it must be contained within the exploration of this idea, the Geisteswissenschaften, uh, the, the studies of spirit, uh, were the, the, the studies left over when empirical science had been subtracted, and that they were real studies. That's what many people thought. And now many, many people have attempted to, to define them and to, to, to uh, extract a method from them, uh, and uh, I don't know whether that is possible, but I want to approach them in another and more simple way through a distinction which I think is fundamental to German idealism uh, and has, rem has or ought, uh, remained or ought to have remained central to philosophy ever since. That's the distinction between subject and object. And now, uh, I, I'm a subject, that's to say, I identify myself in the first person as I. I have a point of view uh, which is connected with my current, my present mental experience, uh, that sense of here and now uh, through which the future cascades into the past, as James Joyce puts it. Um, that's, that is something that you have too. Um, and it, is, uh, it defines, if you like, uh, the place where I am in the world of objects. But um, subjects are not a special kind of object. This is something that Kant showed, in the, I think, in the paralogisms of the Critique of Pure Reason, that we, can't, we don't, in referring to ourselves as subjects, pick out some other kind of object in the world, like the Cartesian ego within, and uh, attribute it to, to it properties that are unobservable to, uh, unobservable to anyone else. Subjects are not a special kind of object. The whole point of them is that they are the things that do the observing, not the object of observation. Uh, and th their being, that their, the existence of a subject, is connected with the uh, availability of a first-person case, the first-person point of view. It's because I can look on my own condition uh, in the first-person case, uh, attribute to myself uh, feelings, thoughts, beliefs, uh, intentions, and so on, that I, uh, uh, I'm entitled to, to identify myself as I. Uh, and um, in a world where there are subjects, there are also uh, relations between them. And indeed, many people argue, and I think rightly, that they only exist because of those relations, that um, the, the first-person case is made available by uh, the language through which we relate to each other uh, uh, as I and you, and one, in, one way we relate to each other and the most important way is by asking ourselves, asking each other the question, why? Why, do you, why? why are you looking at me in that way? Why did you do that? Why are you going to go to that party this evening and so on? Uh, and uh, as we all know, there are at least two different kinds of answer to that question, why, which correspond to, very roughly, to a distinction that's often made between predicting and deciding. When, when I uh, ask you why are you going to that party this evening where you know you'll misbehave and get drunk and so on, uh, you could answer by saying, well, you know, looking back on my past behavior, this has always been the case, that however much I've resisted, at the last minute, I've ended up at the party. That's a prediction. Um, uh, and um, it's a kind of avoidance of the, of the first person, uh, of the, sorry, the second person accountability that I'm asking you to display. If, however, you said, I'm going because I damn well want to, and it's, I've had enough of you nagging me about my drinking habits, 
Um, that is a completely different kind of answer, one which actually accepts the, the sense of the question as asking me to account for myself, and it is a, an attempt to account. Not a very good one, perhaps, but it, it, nevertheless, it, 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 um, it might work, depending on the target. So it, by asking this question, we invite each other to make ourselves accountable. And this, this accountability of one person to another is fundamental to the dialogue between us. But it depends upon first-person knowledge. It's one of the reasons why uh, it's so absurd to accuse animals of crimes in a court of law in the way that, 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 that happened in the Middle Ages so often is that, of course, uh, they don't have the first-person knowledge that enables us to hold them to account for what they do. Uh, we can't, they can't answer the question why. They can't understand the question why. It depends, of, of course, part, well, partly on language, but it must, much more importantly, it depends upon my ability to know without observation what I am doing and the reason that, I'm, that I have for doing it. That is something uh, which uh, I can answer spontaneously without having to apply to myself any kind of criterion of investigation. But this is something that was pointed out in a rather different way and in somewhat obscure language by Elizabeth Anscombe in her book on intention. And I think this is a very important observation that uh, the practice of accountability depends upon <coughs> first-person knowledge. So it depends upon my our habit of identifying ourselves as subjects in the realm of objects. Uh, uh, and for this reason, a purely third personal moral order is, in my view, uh, not possible. We have all these examples of insect societies, and we could think of societies of robots, if, if you like. Insect societies are much better organized than ours, um, much more successful in the right circumstances than we could ever be. Uh, and. Um, you know, uh, they, they, they organize themselves uh, according, to a, a, a uh, according to a laws of motion which uh, dictate more or less the, the favorable outcome uh, uh, when under stress and so on. But they are not moral societies. There is no sense in which the bee who stings the intruder and thereby sacrifices his life has actually done his duty or laid down his life for his friends uh, as, as uh, we are inv enjoined to do. Uh, this is a point which I, I think uh, is somewhat obscured by the game theoretical approach to altruism that, uh, that uh, Simon Blackburn introduced us to yesterday, although that approach is very important. So uh, the world of persons, I, I would say, it, it could be described in another way as the world seen under the aspect of freedom. The world's seen in such a way that we address each other as free beings who are accountable for our actions. Uh, and uh, some people use the word Husserl's world, Lebensfeld, uh, to, to uh, denote this. Well, um, uh, man, many other philosophers have different uh, ways of putting it. Uh, Wilfred Sellers talks about the distinction between the manifest image and the scientific image and so on. Well, uh, whatever w way we put it, we're, I think, committed to a kind of cognitive dualism, that the world in which we live, the Lebenswelt in which we identify ourselves as subjects, uh, is not simply the world of objects. It's the world uh, which c uh, in, in which are situated others like us who respond to ap ap appearances in the way that we respond and require thereby ways of conceptualizing that world that make it possible to respond in that way. So our language is full of concepts of non-natural kinds, uh, concepts that couldn't feature in the scientific worldview because they don't uh, identify a, a, a causally unified class of things, but nevertheless uh, pick up a very important aspect of the appearance of the world. I'll give you three examples there. The concept of an ornament a very important concept, uh, but ornaments have uh, uh, virtually nothing in common um, apart from the fact that they interest us in the same way. Uh, a concept of a melody, likewise, is not a, uh, not a concept that could conceivably appear in the science of acoustics. Anybody who's tried to look at the neuroscience of music and seen the mess that they make of the idea of melody will know this. Uh, but more importantly, the, the concept of the face. 
And, uh, and uh, that's what I want to go on to refer to uh, br uh, briefly now. Uh, I will leave out the thought of the, per that the concept of person is not a natural kind concept, though I think that has been emerging from quite a few talks in, in this uh, conference. Okay, so um, what we are then is subjects among objects. We are subjects in a world of objects. And th there's a mystery involved in this, the mystery, if you might put it, of the real presence. Just where, where am I? And where are you? And how do I encounter you? Uh, this isn't solved by ontological dualism. If I thought that you were a Cartesian soul locked within the, the, the body that I encounter, that would make you more difficult to, to meet, not less difficult. Um, it's not solved either, for, as I argue in my book, The Face of God, it's not solved for the, in the theological question either. Uh, if we think of God as purely transcendental, lying beyond the limits of the empirical world, uh, that uh, um, it just makes him inaccessible to us. So what makes us accessible to each other? I, I take the view that this question has nothing to do with consciousness and that all these uh, discussions about consciousness, they're long-standing but futile. There are plenty of conscious beings in this world who are not persons uh, and not subjects. Um, uh, dogs and horses and cats are a very good instance of them. Uh, and their consciousness is a straightforward biological feature which uh, uh, might be difficult to, uh, to pin down, might be difficult to give a theory of, but it is not in itself uh, something which requires us to look upon them uh, uh, as, in some sense, on the edge of things in the way that we are. That's what I'm saying, but I know that's a very controversial thing because there's a whole academic industry from which funding will be removed when my view is triumphant. Um, <coughs> so, doubtless, it will not be triumphant. Um, I think it's better to approach this uh, in a way which I, I think um, Tim Chappell was approaching it uh, yesterday uh, through uh, uh, the thought of people like Levinas and so on who emphasized the point that we face each other. And uh, Levinas described the human face as visitation and transcendence, meaning, um, that's not me, uh, uh, meaning that, um, that in some way people come before us in their, spa in their, face, in their face as though coming from, from a point beyond the world, even though there is no place beyond the world. We, we see it as though we were looking through into what they are. The face is, is understood as a boundary and a threshold. Uh, Dante describes the, the eyes and lips as balconies of the soul in the convivio. Um, but of course, that's not how my face is for me. My face is hidden from me. So I have a great question, of course, in my own case, that how can I be identical with this thing that I see only when I search for it, like looking in a mirror and so on. Uh, we all live in this very strange uh, uh, condition where, whereby we know others uh, in the most important way rather better than we know ourselves. And sometimes when we catch sight of our face in a mirror, especially when engaged in some embarrassing activity, uh, um, like um, putting a hand on the forbidden knee, um, then uh, you know, we are shocked that, that, you know, that can't be me doing that and I can't look like that when I do it that's awful um, you know, and m much moral education uh, emerges from mirrors in that way <laughs> but, but, but when we see others uh, they, we don't have this problem we, it is absolutely clear to us that there is the other person this isn't just a, a, a piece of flesh there is a, it's there's something shining in it, and that thing that shines in it, some people would call the soul, but it might, might be better just to call it the eye. Uh, the, um, that's, in other words, the subject shining in the world of objects. And none of this, of course, justifies Cartesian dualism. Uh, on the contrary, <coughs> if it justifies any kind of dualism, it's a sort of cognitive dualism, whereby we look on the world in two quite different ways, uh, as a collection of objects or as something which, as it were, uh, is pierced from behind uh, by, by the subjects who wander in it. 
Rembrandt was brilliant at capturing this idea, and it came uh, up with the, the true self-portrait, the first real self-portraits in art, which show the subject incarnate in the object uh, and dying there. Uh, and this is what, why his face is uh, so fascinating. And that, that you see death growing in the shadows of it, and that is my death. You know, uh, and that's th there is the eye uh, peering straight at you from, from that face. Uh, and there's a kind of, many people say there's a kind of redemption of the human condition contained in this way of painting it. Uh, it shows that it, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to be embodied. Right. Uh, so um, when we read the face, then uh, we don't read it as we read um, the faces of animals. Uh, animals do have things that are a bit like faces they are, in which they give natural signs of their emotions. Uh, dogs, uh, cats and horses do and so on. Uh, but we don't, as, as it were, see them in their face, find them in their face in the way that we find each other in our face. Um, uh, Duncan in, in, in Macbeth says to Macbeth after he's uh, referring to the Thane of Cordor who's just been killed, that, 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 that there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. In other words, there's nothing that I can be taught which will help me to see who is my real friend and who is not from the face. And that was immediately proved true by Shakespeare because Duncan himself is killed by the person he trusts. So there are deceiving faces. Uh, let's say faces which, uh, which show you the person as he is not. On a carefully designed to do so. Confidence men work hard on it. But there aren't deceiving knees. Uh, or, you know, there, there, there are, it's not just a, a natural feature of any part of the human anatomy that it can deceive us. It, the human anatomy can only deceive us uh, when it presents us with the other subject. And you might say the face is the subject uh, revealed in the world of objects. And that means, uh, and I'm doing a little bit of you know, rough and ready phenomenology here, obviously. Uh, th it does mean that the face can be seen in two ways, either as a, as a piece of flesh, part of the organism, uh, of no more uh, intrinsic significance than the rest of the body, or it can be seen as the revelation of the, of the self. And that's one reason why uh, in eating habits, we, cu we cultivate good manners. Good manners means roughly speaking, those ways of eating which enable the, the, uh, the subject still to shine forth in the object. Um, uh, uh, you know, and the mouth uh, remains as val uh, a balcony of the soul, as Dancy says. Uh, but of course, modern eating habits are not like that. <laughs> uh, uh, so here you see one way of seeing the face and, uh, and a better way whereby the, the smiling eyes and the smiling mouth respond to each other and the food is some kind of a accidental um, event which is quickly disposed of. So uh, and the same that you saw there, a smile, uh, of course, uh, and smiles are extremely interesting. Milton beautifully says in Paradise Lost that uh, uh, talking of, of Eve, uh, the relation between Adam and Eve in Paradise, that uh, smiles from reason flow brute denied and are of love the food. It's a very important observation. It shows how philosophical Milton was. Uh, you know, only a rational being can smile. You know, animals can't smile. Moreover, it, uh, smiles are, th are the object uh, and the target of, uh, of loving uh, sentiments in the person who observes them. So, um, and these are very important thoughts. Uh, I mean, he, Milton is trying to say that uh, in his description of Adam and Eve, which of course is an incomparable description of how it, com how it came about that, uh, that subjects came into existence in a world of mere objects. You know, uh, he's trying to show that, um, that we, are, uh, we are so constructed that we are revealed in our bodies. Uh, and this means that voluntary smiles are not full smiles. And a lot of people, uh, I'm afraid, this is the normal condition uh, of politicians now, those voluntary smiles uh, which are much better executed by skulls than by human faces, but nevertheless, um, <coughs> that, that these, these are things which uh, tend to put us off and certainly don't elicit from us the kind of tenderness that, that Milton is referring to. Uh, a, 
a real smile is called forth by its object. You smile at the person because, you know, it's he who has brought your smile to the surface of your face in the way that uh, somebody might bring a blush to the surface of your face. And blushes are very interesting in this regard, of course, because they cannot be voluntary. They are involuntary changes of the face which only a rational being can accomplish. It's a very strange thing. Um, uh, I had a couple of pigs once that, um, because they have translucent flesh, uh, they, you know, they, they, you cannot, they often reveal the flow of blood uh, beneath, especially after Valpolicello, it's really got them going. Uh, my, my, my pig called Singer, uh, one was called, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was particularly fond of Valpolicello and he would always uh, develop this huge flush in his face afterwards, but no way could you see this as a blush because there wasn't that sense of being observed eye to eye and due to me uh, that, uh, that a, a rational being can have, which is the, the ground, as it were, of the, of the involuntary blush. So, uh, back to smiles. Involuntary smiles are seen uh, as gifts, in other words. It's the recipient who calls them forth. And we have, uh, this is why we're always thinking in terms of, when we're think, thinking of smiles and laughter and so on, uh, as to whether there is a, whether there's the real emotional base for these things, or whether they are phony. That, that those are the points where always we're on the lookout for whether we're being deceived or not. And uh, much of our laughter, of course, comes about not because we're amused, but because we cease to be amused. I'm just going to give you a little, a, a wonderful smile in art, which is uh, Rembrandt's mother. Um, Hardly uh, an inflection of the f of the f of the mouth, but uh, you know that so be beautifully illustrates um, Milton's thought. Right, uh, I better hurry on now uh, towards the end. Um, right, so all that suggests, and that's just from ordinary day-to-day -day experience, that we don't just look on the world with the eye of science as a collection of objects whose laws of motion we are to explore and which we understand by, by uh, developing uh, systematic theories, uh, we look on the world in another way as containing subjects. Uh, and our, direct, our attitudes directed towards subjects have what I call a, an overreaching intentionality. Our other directed states of mind, uh, as it were, reach through what they target to something else, or rather not to something else. Uh, they reach through, but they don't, there is no uh, thing behind the world of objects which they are trying to touch. They're t it's a simply a reaching through, a reaching through to the other, uh, the other who is revealed in the world of objects. And I think that that is how we should understand the humanities, the Geisteswissenschaften, that they, they amplify our ways of reaching through, our ways of seeing the world not just human beings, but the world as a whole, the world of, of, of human creation and also the world of nature as, as speaking to us, speaking to that part of ourselves which wants to uh, make itself accountable and make itself accountable not just to others but for its own life. And that's why we call them humanities. This is what we really mean by humanity in the end, this, this aspect of ourselves. Um, and I would say that we have this overreaching intentionality and directed uh, in all sorts of uh, ways to the world that we know it is a kind of mystery, but it's not the mystery that uh, Cartesians and so on have uh, led us to think. Uh, there isn't a mystery here except in the, the world as a whole. It's the mystery of being. How can there be a world in which there are not just objects but also subjects? And that mystery comes back to us even, uh, as I was implying earlier, even at the roots of scientific inquiry, when we get down to those particles uh, and we have to come face to the face that, with the fact that it's subjects who are exploring them, you know, uh, suddenly those particles dissolve again. Uh, and this means that, that um, we, we ought to take heart in the fact that we have other forms of knowledge than the, those made available by science. Culture is one of them. Culture, by acquiring culture, we acquire knowledge of what to feel in, in ordinary s situations in everyday life, but also knowledge of 
what to feel in response to those great expressions of human aspiration like Simone Martini's Annunciation. We, we learn how to use objects in order to relate to subjects. You know, uh, that means learning, for instance, how to use poetry in order to communicate with each other, how to distinguish poetry which has genuine sentiment in it from poetry which is full of fake sentiment, uh, um, and how to, for instance, to, to make uh, just plain objects stand against each other so that they, they too seem to glow with an inner light. This is a little corner of um, <coughs> Santa Maria della Pace by Pietro da Cortona in, in Rome, where you see uh, just what uh, architecture should be, and you might go out and compare it with what they're doing with the Radcliffe Infirmary outside, just so you realize what we've lost. Um, I did want to say something about ad addiction, but I won't. I'll say something about kitsch instead. Uh, going back to that, remember the picture of saint Hilarion uh, being tempted? Um, <coughs> our natural response to that, or our, uh, rather not natural, perhaps our sophisticated response, is that it's a fake. The emotions here are not real. Uh, all the gestures have been overdone in order to indicate... He might just as well have scrawled on it, you know, uh, revulsion, uh, temptation, etc., uh, rather than try and... Uh, put it into human shape. There's a self-dramatization as well, of course, of the, of the, um, the saint himself. Uh, what, uh, what is kitsch? I think that this is one of the great questions which um, the, uh, the Geisers Wissenschaften ought to be answering. Uh, and I think one, one way of putting it is that in kitsch art, we have the subject, the, the feeling subject, uh, that's you who is observing it and the artist who's producing it, but we don't have a proper object. We don't have an object that justifies the feeling that's being aroused or, or, or rather summoned. Uh, you know, th that the object is feeble without any independent human reality, it's something to, to be swept aside. Uh, and it's only there in order to produce the self-glorifying uh, emotions in the person who, who observes it giving him the sense of being a really feeling person without the cost of having to feel anything. Uh, the real, when you look at the Annunciation by Simone Martini, that has a huge cost attached. If you're really to understand that painting, you've got to understand an awful lot about how difficult it is to live as a human being without God uh, and all the other things that, that thoughts that are implied within it. Hermann Broch, in a famous essay uh, on Kitsch, one of the few things written about it, uh, spoke of the, the rise of the kitsch mensch, the person, the, the new kind of human type who prefers kitsch objects to, um, to real expressions of emotion because they make life easier. They enable him to live a kind of short-circuited life with, the, uh, with fake emotions where there should be real ones. So he can cl claim the glory of a full emotional life without the cost of it. And I think there is some truth in that. Uh, and it's one reason why uh, there seems to be an intrinsic connection between kitsch and cruelty. If you look at the official art uh, of, uh, of, of um, Stalinist Russia and uh, Nazi Germany, you will see that it was all kitsch. You know, um, and if you don't believe me, uh, they, there's an example. <laughs> uh, um, <coughs> th this, this was the, uh, the, the art which vindicated uh, the, the, the reduction of human beings to objects. Uh, in a, uh, it enabled people to enjoy the cost of those, those, those comforting emotions without observing what was going on around them. So uh, I won't end with, uh, with that. I've got to, um, I, well, can I, I'll have to go back to Let me just end with that. Um, the, a neutral image. So uh, there's a lot more to be said, of course, about uh, what a humane education would consist in, but getting clear about that question. You know, what is the difference between kitsch and, uh, and real art? Why should we attend to one and avoid the other? What do we learn from one and what do we learn from the other? The, th those are the sort of questions which inevitably must lie beyond neuroscience because they're questions about how the world is for the subject. They're not questions about what the objects are of which the world is composed. So um, that's a plea, therefore, for the thought that, there, that neuroscience will never get us in the humanities uh, any further than we've got already. 
And uh, I think it's important to remember that because, after all, my, my own expertise in aesthetics has been colonized from outside by neuroaesthetics, uh, uh, and I'm, I have an, an obligation to fight back uh, and say that what I know will never be revealed to the people who are spending their time with MRI uh, m uh, machines on their heads. So thank you. That was wonderful, and actually quite a lot of the things that Roger said are in a book which I meant to mention, which is his Gifford Lectures, The Face of God, which is absolutely terrific and covers a lot uh, of this territory. Not all of it, because uh, it's been a very rich talk. But uh, just so I can take advantage, just a quick point, just about neuroaesthetics. You know, um, it's been demonstrated that um, th hearing music stimulates the same dopaminergic pathways as having sex. And so now you know that it is unable to distinguish between hearing the organ played and having your organs played with. And that's about it. Um, so uh, I, I just, just off, 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 offer that as a, uh, a one-line critique of, of, of your aesthetics. But there are much better things to talk about, and Roger is there to quiz. Yeah. Barry, very smooth. Oh, yes, uh, microphone. Thank you. Sorry, there, there it is. Yeah. <coughs> talk and much to agree in but I feel myself being seduced and so I want to just mm. kind of resist a little bit um, I mean I'm wondering how strong the thesis has to be and, and whether you won't allow some things in here which otherwise might be left out I mean, great observation by uh, uh, Wolflin talking about the psychology of architecture said buildings have form because we have bodies when you feel the weight of reaching and stretching when you feel the force of bending then when you look at a building you can see something being gracious mm. and being light or being heavy or being sturdy or being there's, there's a way in which there's an empathy with a building because of information you're getting just from your bodily form and then thinking of other ways in which we might investigate exactly how that information gets to us and how we make use of it we make use of it in dealing with other people I mean when if I see you uh, stabbed in some particular part of your body, I'm likely to go, ouch, and, and almost put a hand on the same part myself, namely because there's a kind of neural mimicry where my somatosensory <coughs> cortex is going to be activated in roughly the similar place for me as I'm observing uh, it being deformed in you. And these things are helping us. They're certainly undergirdings and underpinnings of those ways in which we pay particular attention to the people around us and, and care for them in some way and care even for some aesthetic objects. When they go missing, when people have damage and haven't got those available, then they're not so able to have these attitudes mm. to one another, these reactions. So I just, I just don't want us to lose sight of so, some of the things that makes that possible, including uh, faces and smiling. Sometimes somebody's coming down a path, they're about to cross with me, they smile. I find myself smiling, and I don't know why. Mm. But uh, in a way, having already mimicked them, then a good feeling comes out of me, which is very easy and natural to treat as something I share with them. I don't think I've elicited it. I just think um, I'm, I'm in a shared state, and there's a physiological reason for that. Well, that, that's very true, everything you said. Um, <coughs> I, I certainly don't want to deny not that, that we are embodied creatures uh, and, and that all the things that happen to us happen as a result of that. Uh, and and um, I explicitly try and to avoid committing myself to the view that there's some special part of us which is, as it were, immune f or insulated from the physical world, which is the part that, that is involved in aesthetic uh, experience, etc. Um, and of course there must be a neurophysiological basis for all the things that go on in us. But it doesn't follow from that that we understand those things by tracing them to the basis. Uh, you, you might say, suppose someone thought that a habit of smiling, returning a smile that you've just referred to, uh, uh, is, um, 
in some, some way the result of the operation of mirror neurons and so on. A lot of people ex ex uh, you know, play about with this idea. Um, I would say that might very well be true. Uh, but it wouldn't change uh, the observation that I attributed to Milton, you know, um, that, that uh, smiles are things that rational beings do, and they're understood by rational beings in that way. They're understand, understood as a revelation of what the other person is uh, as, uh, as a, a free subject. And uh, I, uh, therefore, that there are questions to be asked of a smile which won't be solved by the, the neuroscience. You know, if I said, why are you smiling? And you say, well, look, it's those, those damn mirror neurons again. Uh, that isn't the right response. You, uh, you might say, of, yes, I'm t well, it might be. Uh, but yes, and if, uh, but um, the normal, this is, is normally an invitation to, to build upon what has been happening. And it's the building upon it which is significant. Oh, thank you. I now have three hands in the back row, and then somebody halfway down. So I'll work on the back row first, and charting with the gentleman with the glasses. And uh, I think it's. Uh, and then, yeah. No, no, sorry. There's two gentlemen with the glasses. I beg your pardon. Yes, go ahead. The gentleman with the more expensive glasses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so, I think you had your hand up first. Let me, let me go because I'm just following on from Barry. So I, we're in a very ironic situation. I disagree with scarcely anything and applauded nearly all of it until at the end you said, and so neuroscience will never tell me anything that I don't know or inform anything that I do in aesthetics. And I thought, where did that bit mm. come from? And, and I, I suspect this is to prefigure what we will be talking about this evening. I, I hope this will be the main, main topic. But there's various ways one might take that. And uh, a weak claim might, well, no, the strongest claim would be it wouldn't even illuminate what we know in everyday terms. Uh, slightly weak, well, different, I don't know which is weaker. Uh, it could never show you were wrong in what we judge in everyday terms. Uh, or perhaps it could never show that the categories you use in everyday thinking uh, should be jettisoned. And these are all interesting claims, but I didn't see any argument for any of them. Mm. I mean, of course it's possible that those claims are true, but we didn't have an argument yet. I, I totally agree. Uh, and it wasn't in my script even. I don't know why I said it. Uh, except that um, <coughs> it suddenly occurred to me that because I'd cu cut out that bit about addiction, I hadn't got a conclusion. Um, <laughs> so uh, I had to explain myself. Uh, but it is also true that I haven't yet discovered anything in neuroaesthetics that <laughs> has been of any use to me. But, mm. so, so, I mean, essentially that was a thrown down gauntlet wouldn't it, for, for tonight. Yes. Yes. Now, I, I've still got three people on the back row, well, two people left on the back row. I think the gentleman with the more expensive glasses. <laughs> and then there was somebody next to uh, David. So, gentleman with the more expensive glasses first. Okay, um, uh, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. And I was um, interested in the concept of life world and how you use it. Because in Husserl, it's obviously this kind of um, you know, hidden dualism between life world and science. And he says that um, they kind of, in a, in a way, they exclude each other. But I, I'm, I'm, I like to think of them as, you know, there, are, there is a life world of the scientist as well. And also, the science has influence uh, on the life world. So couldn't it be in a way that also, maybe not exactly, that it replaces uh, our, our normal understanding, but that neuroscience at least flows into the life world in different ways? And we see that in culture, actually. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, this is a very important point, uh, that um, the life world is not uh, a, a stable, well, it's not a static thing. Maybe it's stable in certain conditions. Uh, clearly, when talking about his, uh, culture, we're talking about a historical phenomenon. Uh, and um, <coughs> indeed, that's how the, the, the whole, how the humanities emerged. Uh, Barry referred to Verflin's um, Renaissance and Baroque, essentially, wasn't it, that you were referring to, um, which was a, a, a work influenced through and through by Hegel and Burkhardt and so on, uh, of someone who, who thought that uh, indeed that 
cultural objects had to be understood historically, and that the whole enterprise of the, uh, of the human sciences was to uh, give th an account of how it is that uh, one phase of human history evolves from another. Uh, and to some extent, that's a very useful uh, tool in, in, uh, in these areas, although, of course, it involves all kinds of contentious claims. But I, I would certainly say you, you're absolutely right that, uh, that um, at a certain point, the, uh, the sciences can begin to invade the, the Lebensfeld, the world of life, the life world, uh, and, uh, and change its aspect. Uh, but then the question is, um, who is the adjudicator as to whether this is the, the right or the wrong way of using science? I think you would see this, uh, for instance, in sex. Uh, the, the, the science of sex, or the pseudoscience of sex that you get in, in the Kinsey reports and so on, that has invaded people's conception of what sex is. Uh, and it's, um, let's say, it's, it's, it's uh, now represented not as a relation between people, but as a physiological process which has a particular uh, function, ev evolutionary function, uh, and which can be understood in isolation from the human relations that normally or in the past at least, used to grow from it and also make it possible. Uh, and that has a changed our understanding of sex. And with that change has become big changes in human relations. Uh, you know, the Lebenswelt has changed. And the question is, is it for the better? I would say no. But um, in fact, I've written a whole book which comes up with that conclusion. It's a book which is uh, entirely uh, um, based on, uh, on uh, humane ways of thinking. In fact, it was Sellers who pointed out that there is heavy traffic between both the scientific and the manifest image of the world, and, the, mm. the, the sound, and you referred to Sellers. Mm. But I think we've got a third person on, on, on the back row. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to register a rather deep philosophical disagreement. Uh, you see the divide between the manifest and the scientific image as being very, very deep, and mm. much deeper than I do. Uh, it, I think this came up when you put up the two images of the women eating. Uh, it occurred to me that I'd rather eat with the first woman than the second woman, because mm. her delight in the animal pleasures of eating were just so much more obvious. And that's how I would like my friends to be as they eat, not frozen in manners, but just enjoying the food lustily. Uh, and I think this does come down to a rather significant difference. Uh, you think that some kind of cognitive dualism is necessary. Uh, I feel that there's a strange fear of the scientific image you know, bubbling up and taking away all the things in the manifest image from us. But, but I think that if we understand the scientific image all the way up and down, you know, in the, you know, we'll see the paintings we love in the atoms and the people we love in the neurons, and there's no reason to fear, you know, that the eliminativists will win, because they won't, you know. Uh, be a happy reductionist. See in the science, you know, all the things you love. They're right there, and the science explains exactly how they work, and all the science is beautifully ennobled by the fact that all the things you love are right there. <laughs> well, um, that's all the things that you love certainly are. <laughs> but, um, obviously, the, the work has been done in your case, but luckily, <laughs> I have held on to what I had, and I'm still exploring it. Collab collapse of Stout Party, perhaps. Now, um, we've got quite an epidemic of upper limbs, so I'm going to ask people to make their questions short. And uh, who was the first person I identified who's been neglected? Yes, the, the, uh, fine. In the, in the, in the, I've lost the track, so I'll just work my way down. So, gentleman in the red pullover, and I apologize if I get the spatial order wrong, temporal order. I think we're in danger of being distracted. I think the issue is not whether neuroscience can throw any light on uh, our experience as persons, but whether when neuroscience was as finished as it will ever be, the subjective experience of being a person is still something uh, that uh, is, has a sort of validity that is impossible for the neuroscience to uh, capture. Yes, um, that's one way of putting it. I, 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 what I want to say, however, is that, um, that it's not really about understanding, uh, simply understanding what it is to be a person as opposed to, say, an animal or a, or a book. Um, it is also primarily about how the world appears to a person who's taking 
seriously the fact of being a person. Uh, and I want to say that the relation, that the relations between persons which make persons real um, bring into being another way of seeing the world, not just a, another way of seeing each other, but of seeing things like that. Only a person can see what is there, what is really there for us, uh, and in doing so is directing towards it uh, something of that, as it were, subject-hungry intentionality that, w that we uh, um, direct towards each other. Uh, just about, yes, the gentleman in the blue um, thing. Thank you. Um, this is continuing the question, and Barry's question to start with, I think, um, about how the, the, the cognitive dualism doesn't seems to break down in certain cases. Um, and in the cases, I'm, he, Barry gave us an example of mirror neurons being a correct explanation of a smile, perhaps in a situation. But more generally, in, in something like personality psychology or social psychology, we start with concepts and ways of understanding persons which operate in the, in the way of understanding persons, that, that starting point. But then they start to open that out further. So it's not so much um, seeing the world under the description of freedom necessarily. So for instance, when you're uh, thinking of the work of people like Nisbet and Ross and Wilson and people where they say, well, the answer to the question, why did you do that, could be um, mistaken. And, and what, what else is going on is not radically different from the kind of answer that you give when you cite what your reason is. But it is not something that you either identify as reason or which you could identify as a reason. It wouldn't be a reason for you. And yet it nevertheless has a similar effect on your behavior that it might do were it a reason for you. So here it seems to be sort of expanding out the notion of the person, sort of, sort of rubbing the line between one side of the dualism and the other, the subject and the object, a little bit to enter into sort of causal but personal explanations of why people do what they do. Uh, sort of in this cognitive dualism, you need a little sumato in, in, in the middle. You know, you take, take your pencil and you, you've got to rub it down with the thumb so it's not quite so strong. So, I mean, was, how, how sharp do you think this distinction is? Is it open to the possibilities that things like social psychology or personal psychology, dual process ideas of you know, why people do the things that they do, is that possible? on your picture. Yes. Um, I, I, I would say that I haven't got a, a complete theory by any means of practical reasoning or, or, of, uh, or a complete theory of the, the boundary, if you like, between that in me which is, uh, which is as it were, within the, the realm of my subjective awareness and that which is not. Uh, and I think, of course, it was an ambition of the Freudians to extend uh, interpersonal dialogue so as to reach into those dark areas which seem to be uh, inexplorable otherwise. Uh, and um, how far that can be achieved is a great question. I, I'm somewhat skeptical that it can go very far, but one of the purposes of art, I would have thought, is to bring into the sphere of, uh, of first-person awareness those aspects of yourself which are otherwise might be hidden. Do I see any more hands? That's yeah. vid. Uh, yeah. yeah. Gentleman there and the gentleman there. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, if I hope I'm not neglecting this side. So do share. I am? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's the next person in the row. I'll be very brief. Just a very quick comment on, on Kitsch. Um, uh, I enjoyed your comments very much. Thank you. Um, I wonder whether there might be an ever so slightly more sophisticated understanding of kitsch than the simple sort of gratuitous subjective enjoyment of, uh, of, um, of emotion uh, and require a, a presupposition of what other subjects in the world might be experiencing too in front of that object. Mm -hmm. So Milan Kundera, as you may be aware, has written mm -hmm. something on this and he said that um, he defined Kitsch as, Kitsch cries two tears. Um, the first says, how wonderful to see children playing on the grass. And the second tear says, how wonderful to be moved along with the rest of humanity by children playing on the grass. Mm. And it's the second tear that makes Kitsch Kitsch. Yes, I totally agree with that. That's really what I meant by 
um, saying that, th that it involves a, a diversion of emotions towards the subject from the object. It's about me feeling this rather than this, that I'm, this object about which I'm feeling. And I, I think uh, Kunda is right. A bit of affirmative action then for the right-hand side, which has been neglected, so to stay mm. over there. Thank you. I'm just, any injustices are entirely accidental. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I couldn't agree more with your characterization that um, certain of these works of art that you discuss are only available to us as subjects. Mm. Um, but I guess there's a further point in, in your talk, which is a certain drawing attention to or a certain preference for works which also show us off as subjects. Mm. So I think Rembrandt's self-portrait is such a work. And so I wonder what you would say about works of art that show us off as objects. So you might think of, uh, I don't know, uh, Boccaccio there, or certain Roman poets, or Rabelais, or Italian filmmakers like Fellini, or people like that. So I wonder whether there's something these works of art communicate, which is in danger of missing from your account. That's a very good um, question. I hadn't thought of that. I, I don't think that it was in any way necessary for my argument that I happened to show works of art in which the subject, as the subject, is the um, main center of attention. There, there, you're absolutely right, there are, there are works of art which do focus upon the objecthood of the human being, um, sometimes destructively, uh, and sometimes uh, by way of comedy. Uh, if you remember, Bergson's theory of laughter is entirely uh, about this, about the way in which human beings uh, suddenly are revealed to be objects in the middle of their most, uh, as it were, idealized aspirations, and then we all laugh. Uh, I have to say, you know, that's a pretty unsophisticated kind of laughter, but, uh, but it, it is true that um, we, can't, we don't have a true conception of what we are if we don't see uh, that our embodiment is fundamental to it. And that is, of course, uh, something, again, which you might want to reflect upon in the Simone Martini case, uh, uh, that um, he's shaped the embodiment of the Virgin Mary to convey the idea of her. You know, it's not, it's, uh, it's not just the face. Uh, I, sus I suspect this is a, a, what art must do always. Thank you. Yes, a gentleman there, and then a gentleman there. Yes. Thank you. I'm not missing anybody. Here. Here. Sorry, just the um, gentleman there. Yes. Thank you for your, your lecture. You investigated the relation between subject and object, between the subject and the world. I like to take in consideration the opposite, the reverse, mm. the relation between object uh, and the subject. So my, I'm asking you, in that case, uh, the way in which the world is made, the size, the position in space, the color uh, of object, in which way, according to you, they influence your way of thinking, feelings, and the relation that you made with object. In another way, I can say, we can say, that we, if we start from the world, and we go to subject, if we start to the shape, the form, the size of object, perhaps, we can also see in which way would influence our way of thinking, feeling, and so on. So I would like to ask you, what is your position and the way in which things influence ourselves? Well, that's a, a very big question. It's very similar to Vid's question that, 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 that we, I just tried to answer. It, <coughs> it is, of course, true that, that we live in a world of objects and we understand those objects uh, as uh, limiting our actions, as creating the environment in which we can move and think, uh, and we try to adapt them to uh, our purposes and to ourselves. We live in a constant attempt at adaptation. I think that's, uh, uh, and when objects resist our, ad our attempts to adapt to them, um, then we tend to avoid them. You know, and, and one of the, one of the most <coughs> important experiences of, of beauty, in my, my, to my mind, is that of the adapted landscape, such as you know from, from, uh, from Siena. 
you know, the, the landscape which has been adapted to human needs and human uses over centuries, and so smiles at us with the, fa with the same face as the people who made it. You know, that, and I think that is, a, that is our natural response to, to objects, to tame them to our aesthetic needs. Uh, and um, so I think that they are, fun, they are totally part of the, uh, of the relation that I've been talking about. Gentleman in the white shirt, just halfway up. There's a up. <coughs> Thank you. Um, you drew a picture of the wait, just wait for the microphone. Thank you, so we can record everything you say. Um, so, thank you. You drew a picture um, in which subjectivity, first-person awareness, is, a, is was very clear um, as an all-or-nothing concept, and you uh, were very dismissive of the idea that animals. Um, might have something like that, but although you didn't talk very much about animals except the charming anecdote about the pig who drank the wine. But we all accept, I take it, that there was a time when there were no human beings on this world, but there were uh, creatures who are regarded as antecedents to those human beings. Of course, this is a huge theological controversy, but I would take it that in a gathering like this, we are not we're all on one, I would hope we were all on one side in this, and that um, human beings did evolve gradually. So how do you, so is really subjectivity so all or nothing? You were very dismissive about consciousness. Personally, I would think that consciousness has something to do with the gradation which ended in what we all recognize as full-blown full subjectivity. What is your take on this? <coughs> I think there are gradations that, that, um, that underlie uh, the transition from, from the uh, animal to the self-conscious state. That's, uh, that, that, that's undeniably true. But I, I think there are also these uh, transitions from quantity to quality, as Hegel puts it. You know, that's, there is uh, uh, suddenly something emerges. Like when you're... Um, putting dots on a, on a piece of paper, suddenly there's a face. You know, um, maybe there's a little bit of, uh, of leeway into whether you can see a face before that final dot that clinches it. Uh, but um, it, it could be that, nevertheless, that, 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 that this is an abrupt transition. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to agree that it is, but uh, I'm inclined to think that it is an abrupt transition from the... the the non-language using to the language using creature. If there is such a process of transition, you think neuroscience would be totally irrelevant? No, I think it would have a lot to say about it. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, that doesn't follow from that. It has not much to say about the, th um, the things at the other end that I'm talking about. It may have. Gentlemen, just there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Thinking about different forms of literature, um, thinking about violent literature or violent film versus literature which gives a very rich vision of a human person. And it seems to me part of, the, part of the problem with that is that it doesn't tell the full truth about human beings. Now, can we escape talking about what a human being is uh, in order to follow your line of thinking? You mean that human beings are rubbish? No, no, I mean that if that I think one problem with, with gladiatorial games or with a violent movie is that oh. it, it's a self-indulgent way of um, approaching art, whereas if we approach art instead to grasp the truth of what a human person is, then it helps us. Yes, I, I see what you're getting at. Well, this goes back to the question of kitsch. Actually, uh, uh, I, I would say that kitsch is not um, a morally neutral, harmless thing, uh, for the reasons that Kundera was saying. That the kitsch is inculcating in us a habit of self-centered narcissism, which makes it easier to be cruel. That's why I showed that picture uh, of Stalin with the roses. Uh, and uh, I suspect the same is true of the violent video games. Uh, I certainly think being interested in such things and growing to need those, those things 
cannot be in itself a healthy thing. Uh, and, um, it, but to say why is another matter. Uh, and that's why I probably should have said, if I had time, I would have said something about addiction. Uh, David Papineau, I think it was, referred to this yesterday and rightly said that here is something about which neuroscience has something important to say. You know, that, um, that uh, uh, there are certain, uh, certain things that we do which release dopamine into the, uh, into the cerebral uh, system, uh, which uh, is a, a, a reward mechanism which, which sets up or hardens the, the um, neural circuits that produce it. Uh, and if you, sh uh, the shorter those circuits are, the more you're going to uh, get into the situation where you just want to press a button and repeat it. Uh, and that is something, of course, which ha we know happens uh, with uh, uh, alcohol, uh, smoking, uh, uh, masturbation, and so on. Uh, and um, some people think, yes, it also happens uh, 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 with television and the television image. The five-second cut in B-movies uh, Chick sent Mackay and people and his team have done a lot of research on this, and it suggests that it's the same mechanism there. It's certainly the obviously the same mechanism in in b video games. Uh, and the more violent they are, the, of course, the more you recognise this. Here is a person who really needs that image of the human body being destroyed, uh, and it's no different from pornography in that respect. And I, yeah, I think it, we have an I have a natural sense that this is wrong. And it's more wrong than, than drinking, probably. Um, but, uh, <laughs> in fact, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, well done, Barry. You take over oh. from me there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's just time for one very quick question, soliciting a very quick answer. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, sorry, I just want to ask a question in relation to, um, also to the catch. Um, you refer the whole time to art as having a purpose and art as having a meaning. Um, I just want to know on the first hand, must art always have a function in that sense? And in um, defining kitsch, is, will kitsch only have to do with the message or um, would it have to do with the technique as well? Because if one looks at that picture of Stalin, uh, you know, it's painted quite well. And also socialist realism and socialist art was uh, a realist art that is well mm. painted, but you know, the message is maybe skewed. So my question would come to, would kitsch only would you only determine if something is sketched or not through the message, or could it be in the style and the use of color and the use of lines as, as well? I think that's a really important question, and, uh, and it's what you'd need a whole course on, uh, on visual aesthetics to, to answer. Uh, I, I tend to the view that Kitsch lies as much in the style as in the message, and that indeed it's the way of presenting the message rather than the message. That, that, that makes something into kitsch. Uh, but how to define it is, you know, I think nobody has ever really succeeded. And um, I think maybe one day I might try and, and give a, the, the, the final account of kitsch, but it will be too late because there won't be any non-kitsch art left to contrast <laughs> it with. Oh. <laughs> On that extremely optimistic note, um, <laughs> The good news is, I guess, alcohol is coming, and the other vices you mentioned, we can make a personal choice, but not do it in public, I guess. <laughs> so, so, ladies and gentlemen, I think that was a fantastic talk, which provoked a very rich Q&A. So thank you, Roger. <laughs> thank you.